This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Jonathan, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Hi, Bob. It's good to be back. Before we get into today's topic, which is dissecting the first two episodes in the new series from Robert Reich, we will mention, again, the Mies Institute has this campaign where they're giving away many, many copies of Rothbard's classic, What Has Government Done to Our Money? And it wasn't a good thing. I'll I'll tell you that in case case you haven't read it yet. And if you want to get your copy, just go to Mises.org slash H-A pod free. So that's for human action podcast free. So again, it's Mises.org slash H-A pod free to get your free copy. And in fact, if you want, you can request multiple copies. And if you want to hand them out to a reading group that you have, or you know some kids that are homeschooled or what have you, they don't have to be homeschooled. Actually, they probably need it more if they're not homeschooled. But in any event, get your copy of What Has Government Done to Our Money? This is not a pretty story. All right, so speaking of things that are not pretty, I was going to say Jonathan, but it's like I was making fun of you. I'm not. I'm making fun of Robert <laughs> Reich. So he's, uh, he's got this new series out where he's tackling myths about the economy. And the first two episodes have dropped, so I thought it might be fun for us to, well, fun might be the wrong word, to periodically touch base and just go over. The, the, these little episodes from Reich are very short, and so it, you know a lot of times it wouldn't make sense to devote a whole episode of us responding to his three-minute uh, eruption. But here, the first two have dropped, and so I thought this would be a good time for us to, uh, to check in with the folks at home and let them know what Reich is up to. So this first one, maybe let's go ahead and we'll play him, Jonathan, or at least an excerpt from it, and then we'll respond in kind. So here's an excerpt, folks, from the first one from Robert Reich. Have you heard this lie? Economics is an objective science that has nothing to do with politics or morality. Bunk. If you really want to understand the economy, you have to understand politics and also morality. They're treated as separate fields, separate disciplines. Each has its own experts and specialists, but the three are completely intertwined. In fact, through most of the 1800s, the field of study that we call economics was called political economy. People who studied it saw that the two fields were the same. Adam Smith, the Scotsman who wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, is considered the father of economics, especially by conservatives. But he never called himself an economist. He called himself a moral philosopher. Why? Because he was really interested in the meaning of a good society. That's what it's all about, or should be all about. What sort of society do we want? Okay, so I'll uh, maybe let you take the first crack at that, Jonathan. How do you feel about what just happened there? So in this uh, video, he's making the claim that we we shouldn't think about economics as a value free science. Uh, he he. It, one issue with the video is that there's really not a lot of substance to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's just sort of making these assertions. He says we. Uh, the way that we ought to think about economics is that it's in this sort of mush with politics and morality. Uh, so he makes these claims. He uh, says he says Adam Smith called himself a moral philosopher, and uh, back in the history of economic thought, the science was referred to as political economy. And really, those are the only two points that he makes that is like is a positive case for why we should think about economics in this way. Mm-hmm. And then he just sort of lists off some like progressive agenda type stuff, um, questions like uh, uh, how much wealth inequality or income inequality is acceptable? Uh, is it okay for corporations to have lots of power? Uh, what should what should the minimum wage be? These sorts of questions. Uh, and while, while those questions do relate to economic topics, uh, it, it, he's, he's just sort of asserting that those are the sorts of questions that, that – uh, economics should deal with, and therefore economics is inseparable from politics and morality. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so so my my first impression from it is that it's it's really, there's a big lack of substance. He's not really making a solid argument for his case here. He's just, he's just sort of riffing. He's just sort of like making, making these claims without much substance behind it. Yeah, that was, 
my thought as well, and I kind of alluded to it with you before we hit the the go button here on recording that, and I was I thought these, these when I heard Reich was going to do a whole series on what he thought were economic myths or whatever the title is, I was excited thinking, oh, here's some good grist for the mills, kind of like you know the old <laughs> Krugman days when he has a new column coming out and, but. Yeah, I was I was sort of underwhelmed by the uh, by the first two episodes in the in a sense. Um, so yeah, on this one in particular, right? I mean, it's I guess I don't know enough of the history. I mean, I've I've certainly read a lot from you know David Hume and people like that, like back when you know it would have been called political economy, and you know, and I've read some Adam Smith, obviously, and you know, oh, moral philosopher and blah blah blah. But um, I think. I'll just throw this out there, Jonathan, and also in conjunction with, like, when at Hillsdale College, where I was first a student, and then I taught there, they did have a course that was called political economy, which was distinct from you know microeconomics or macro. You know, it was a separate course, and in there, the, like the guy who taught it was Gary Wolfram when when I was there, um, and he, the text for that class was Bastiat's The Law, and so it was, you know, it, it, in other words, that was distinct from what you would go learn in micro economics, you know, so it wasn't talking about how, how are prices formed or, you know, market structures and things like that. It, it was, or what happens if there's a price control? It was just more talking about like, what's the proper role of government. So it was, it, it was mixing in value judgments and politics and all this stuff and what's the proper role of government. Um, but to me, that's, that's a distinct thing. And certainly Mises argued at length that economics, you know, as, as it, as it progressed, I mean, I think that's partly what the issue is too, that it wasn't clear with the classical economy, like, you know, as, as economics became its own distinct discipline and, you know, Mises and human action says that economics is the youngest of the sciences. And, and, and that's and one of the points he makes throughout that is that the opponents of what the teachings of the economists were like the economists talking about the benefits of free trade and so the protectionists would come back and just, you know, try to dismiss economics as, as not being a valid science. That, oh, you're just you're smuggling in your value judgment. Exactly what Reich is, is trying to do now. So Mises was taking great pains to, to argue that, no, me, economics is an objective science. And yes, it, people have desires and ends. But like, for example, if if you wanted to cause high unemployment and cause the business cycle, you would need to study economics first to know what causes those things. And then you would go do it. So it's not strictly speaking, it's not that economics tells you unemployment is bad or that price controls are bad. It just says, if you impose price controls, this is what's going to happen. And that's a cause and effects claim, just like a chemist could tell you, if you mix these substances together, this is what's going to happen. That, that doesn't involve a value judgment. Yeah, that that was the uh, the direction that I took in the little article that I wrote in response to this video. Um, so I'm glad you brought up Mises. Uh, one thing that Mises does a lot in Human Action and elsewhere is is when he when he is addressing critics of the different ideas that he's bringing up. Uh, very often <laughs> he'll say these guys they said all this but there's not really a good argument like they they've criticized it but there's not there's not an argument that they're making and then what mises does is he actually constructs an argument for them he says now if they really wanted to argue mm -hmm. against this then they would say x and then mises would would criticize that and it's well some people might uh think that that sounds like uh, mises is always constructing straw men uh, when he's doing his his arguments but but that's not true because mises does address he addresses the criticisms as they stand and says, you know, this is, I, they're just, you know, using words in the incorrect way or there's, there's, not, a, there's not a way to, to grapple with this. And, he said, and then he strengthens their argument uh, and then uh, attacks that or, or says why that, that cri criticism that they're making uh, doesn't stand. Um, and so I did the same thing with uh, Reich's video here. I said, um, if... If he really wanted, uh, this is a quote from the article, if he really wanted to contend that economics is inseparable from politics and ethics, he could have made the case that some of the underlying assumptions in economics are value-laden, or that legal institutions like private property often form the basis for markets to exist in the first place. Now, that is a good argument. So if uh, Reich is making this claim that uh, economics is inseparable from, from politics and morality, it like one one path that you could take to to make that claim is to say 
a, a, a lot of price theory. Uh, a, a lot of the stuff that we talk about with markets depends on institutions like private property, or where people uh, understand that I'm going to produce something and then bring it to market and trade with other people who have produced other things. So there's this underlying uh, assumption, if you will, that uh, people own things, which which is a that's oftentimes it's a political institution or a legal framework that's enforcing uh, that that ownership, and so that that would be a much better argument for him to make is that that's why economics is inseparable from politics and morality. So so I I just sort of imputed that argument to, to Reich. I said, okay, let's assume that he made that argument. That's really what he was, was trying to say, uh, because that is a stronger argument. And so then, and so then to, to address this argument, I made the claim that actually what, what Mises is doing when he's constructing this praxeological economic edifice is he's starting with some really fundamental categories of, of human action. So what does it mean for us to uh, attain or uh, seek to attain our ends by using means according to our ideas, uh, and then and then as you progress, as you develop uh, things like the laws of utility, diminishing margin utility, the law of returns, market prices, economic calculation, division of labor, all of these other sorts of things, the way that it progresses is typically we're we're bringing in the conditions that we notice in the real world. So like what what sort of things do we notice about the world that we live in, and understanding some of the 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 primordial stuff, the the really fundamental stuff. How how do we um, how do we explain market prices in uh, a situation where uh, there's the enforcement of private property, where where we have those sorts of legal and political and moral norms in effect? Um, and in fact, that's really the only uh, circumstance in which you can get those market prices. So the the point I'm making is this: is that those Moral and political considerations are are mere conditions that we're applying to the, our building out of economic theory. Uh, when we, <clears throat> it, it's the, it's the same way that the um, an engineer who's trying to explain the flight of a plane will have to rely on the conditions that the plane exists and, and the conditions in which the plane will fly, like like uh, drag from air molecules and and the the gravity that's on Earth and all, all of these sorts of specific conditions, he's bringing that into his analysis. That doesn't that doesn't bias the analysis. That helps him know which laws of physics to apply to the situation, and also to help to help explain the phenomenon that's in, in, in that's in question. So bringing in these conditions like uh, like private property doesn't bias all of the analysis. All it does is it says these are the circumstances in which we're we're trying to explain the existence of market prices, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with everything you just said there. Just some of my thoughts on this. And again, I, I'm going to try to do what you did too. Like I'm, Reich didn't give us much to work with on this one, but we can kind of say, well, maybe what he could have meant was, <laughs> or, or if I were to, <laughs> you know, if I were in a, in a debating club and were assigned, you know, his side of the, of the resolution. Um, so first, yeah, let me just mention that, uh, like for example, the so-called marginal revolution. So I'll I'll try to remember to link, folks. Um, I had an article in the, I guess it was the Journal of Libertarian Studies. We did a a comprehensive response. It was a whole edition was devoted to Kevin Carson's book, where he tried to rehabilitate the labor theory of value. And you know, I just went through and and I and I was arguing. Like, here's my understanding of what the labor theory of value was historically, and then here's the marginal revolution. And I was explaining. You know why did economists abandon the old view and, and embrace the new one? And it was to me, it was kind of like the same reason people like Einstein's system more than Newton's. That you know the the modern subjective value theory could explain in terms of explaining the formation of market prices, right? So we we don't have a dog in the fight. It's not that we're trying to justify capitalism or something. We just know just under you know look around the world, and you see that there's markets. That's a thing, and there's prices, and they must something must explain where they come from and how they get, you know, pinned down or what have you and why do they move in certain patterns and that the subjectivist explanation marginal utility approach to that just worked on so many levels it could explain everything that the cost of production theory or labor theory of value could explain and all kinds of other cases that it couldn't and it avoided certain like, you know, circular arguments and stuff. So, you know, I have, I make that case, but one where I I do understand where they're coming from, Jonathan is 
I don't know how much it's on your, you know, the, the Cambridge capital controversy is what I have in mind. And so there, one of the arguments from the UK, you know, critics of what they were calling the neoclassical approach is they were saying, oh, they want to say that interest is the, is the return to the marginal product of capital. And they're trying to make it analogous to just like wages are, you know, the return due to the marginal product of labor. And so they want to give capitalists the same moral legitimacy to their earnings that workers get right now. And so they were arguing that this wasn't merely a disagreement over, you know, what, where, how, how does, what determines the interest rate and equilibrium in an economy with these, you know, specifications. But they were saying, no, there's something deeper going on here that the neoclassicals agenda, it, whether it was conscious or subconscious, was that by trying to teach people that, oh, what interest really is, it's the return to the marginal product of capital, that makes it seem like it's a perfectly normal thing. Whereas if, if that's not what interest is, and then, you know, like Schroff's models and whatever, Joan Robinson, they can come up with models where that's not the case, where interest is not just pinned down as this equilibrium thing. It's like indeterminate and it's due to bargaining power and stuff like that. And you could just as well have a 3% rate of interest as an 8% and they'd both be consistent with equilibrium. Well, then, you know, now that it's it's moved into a, a political arena and it's it's more about, you know, as a society, what do we want to do in terms of who gets what? So... Anyway, I don't know if you. So, in that context, I, I, I can see why they were arguing that and how they thought what seems to be on the surface just a disagreement about how should we model the economy was actually, you know, uh, camouflaging a deeper disagreement about uh, other social issues. Yeah, th- this reminds me of what uh, Hazlitt uh, mentioned in the. I, uh, it's not chapter one. It's I think it's the introduction to economics in one lesson, where he says that uh, one reason why economics is haunted by so many fallacies. He uses the term haunted, uh, is because of the 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 implications for uh, for economic ideas. So so if the people who are making the laws have a certain set of economic ideas, uh, then that that leads to or that could lead to uh, lots of. Um, money flowing into a particular industry or an industry being protected by tariffs. And so like, if you can, if you can devise economic theory in such a way that convinces the people who are making policy or voting on policy, uh, then, then there's, there's all of this extra special interest involved. And and that is what Hazlitt identifies as at least one cause of, of, of all of the fallacies that we see in economics is, is because people, people are biased. People realize that if we, if we can construct economic models or economic theory in a certain way, then we can get these uh, special benefits or punish our competitors for another example. One thing that I uh, mentioned in the article is that uh, it, it's actually, it's impossible for Reich to make the claims that he's making because uh, he, he, he starts listing off these, uh, these questions um, about wealth inequality and, and corporate power and minimum wage legislation in order for him to have any sort of answer to those questions, he has to have s- some objective understanding of cause and effect. Mm-hmm. So, like, e- e- so like you and I would would probably say that he's wrong about a lot of those cause and effect relationships that he thinks exist. But nevertheless, that shows that he has to rely on something that's value free, so, j- something that's just pure cause and effect. Like if we implement uh, this minimum wage, then that's going to cause a utopia for everybody or something like that. Uh, so he's he he has he has this cause and effect in the background, which means that he he's he, he has to think that there's at least there's some at least some core of economics that isn't uh, based on the political and and morality mush that he's that he proposed at the beginning of the video. So, like I say in the article, uh, to propose such things, he has to have some understanding about what causes what. He he must have some idea about objective cause and effect before he can suggest certain causes to bring about his desired effects. Um, and then I just throw out this like absurd example where I, I say we might as well respond to Reich by saying, yes, let's eliminate inequality by requiring every plumber in Montana to eat liverwurst at 6 a.m. On, on Tuesday. So, in order for Rice to respond to that by saying that's absurd, that wouldn't, that wouldn't bring about, uh, that wouldn't eliminate inequality. It means that he's relying on some objective cause and effect. So there's something about economics that, that is, that is value free. 
I don't know that I've ever used the word liverwurst in an economics article. So <laughs> that's that's good. Um, yeah, that uh, great great illustration of that. Um, it just this isn't related really, except in, the, in that narrow sense that I when I try to get across people my my frustration when they explain to me why they're voting for who they're voting for. And sometimes I'll say, oh, yeah, so like I'm, I'm getting ready to leave my apartment and someone stand there and I go and I, I put with magnetic letters, I spell out Trump on my fridge. And they go, why did you just do that? And I say, oh, because of the Supreme Court. You know how bad Biden would be if he was, okay, and then we, and let's go. And the point being that me doing that, so likewise me voting for Trump as a Massachusetts resident does not at all affect who the next president, anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, back to this. <sighs> Right. So that, that's a good one. It, it's similar to, or it reminds me of Mises' discussion in human action. It's good because this is the human action podcast, so I'm not going to shy away from constantly bringing it back to the book. And uh, we're, right now we're in the middle of uh, Rothbard Graduate Seminar where we're studying human action. Oh, so. great. Okay. Yes. yes. Very good. I, w- I was going to ask you at the end to, uh, to explain what that was. So he explain so in you know the way it's laid out you know first he just talks about the nature of praxeology and you know, some of the epistemological issues of, of you know how does economics relate to the other sciences and so on and then he gets into you know individual action and then the analysis of the catalactics in the pure market economy and he takes a moment to deal with the objection that well come on in the real world right now there is no pure market economy and you economists who study it and hold it up as some ideal you're just smuggling in your value judgments that and Mises' point, again, just to uh, reflect what you just said there, Jonathan, is to say, no, even if you were, like, if your goal is to have a, a huge welfare state and, you know, a massive intervention, or even if you're an outright socialist central planner, to explain why your approach is better, we need to know what's what would happen if we didn't do that. What would happen if we just had a laissez-faire, you know, market economy, and then maybe we, you would think and see how awful that would be. And so, therefore, we want to have large interventionism to avoid all those evils. But you don't know that it's a bunch of evils unless you first study what would happen if the government's policy is merely, you know, to enforce contracts and whatever, prevent outside militaries from coming in and conquering and so on. So, you know, again, just making the basic point to, to do anything, to know any, the, it, that to have any idea of what, quote, what should the government do, because that seems to be a big concern for Reich, to go achieve, you know, yeah, even if we could be agreed, yes, we want to help poor people, we want to reduce income inequality, you need to know, well, what sorts of policies would lead to those results? And that necessarily is a value-free, positive analysis of just how does the world work? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. So economics, uh, it's, it's value-free, it's, it's a set of cause and effect claims, uh, and, and the way that it's constructed uh, typically be, if if we want the science to be interesting to us, obviously we want it to help us explain the world around us. So to the extent that we bring in the the political stuff, the legal stuff, it's because we're trying to explain the way that our current world works. But by bringing those things in in there, as I mentioned before, that's not that's not biasing the whole science. That's not that's not uh, conceding that all of economics is just morality or all of economics is just politics. It's mainly we're just trying to figure out what laws of economics apply in this sort of situation. Uh, and also, we're in, like, like Reich is, just as much as we are, we're interested in understanding the effects of different government policies. So like, if the government does X, what is, what's going to be the result? Um, and, and you have to have that objective cause and effect science in order to, to make those claims and understand the world around mm-hmm. us. And just to give two examples that come to mind as to why Mises himself was not, quote, dogmatic, is he uh, he conceded that under certain theoretical conditions, monopoly, what he called a monopoly price, could violate consumer sovereignty. And I you know Israel Kirzner was big when he was explaining that, you know, portion of Mises' views. Like he thought that was good, like to show, you know, Mises was being honest and just saying, yep, this could this could be an area where the market economy now Rothbard disagreed with that in man economy and state. And I think actually Rothbard's analysis, his critique makes sense, but Still, that just showed Mises was not only saying, yep, free market, rah, rah, and I'm going to just hide. And also, something I recently covered in my personal podcast, the issue of, in principle, if even if we had 100% reserve banking and the community used hard money like gold coins, in principle, Mises thought, yeah, if there's a big gold discovery and if that new money enters the economy early on through the loan market, 
that could set into motion what we now call, you know, an Austrian business cycle, even though, you know, that wouldn't involve government intervention. It, it wouldn't be as big as one that was fueled by a central bank and whatnot and FDIC and all that stuff. But still, you know, Mises was conceding. So anyway, I'm just giving two examples where Mises, it's not that he knew what he wanted the answer to be and worked backwards. It was he really sat through and the reason in general he thought the market economy, private property and so on was the best means of promoting human welfare is because that's what he thought. Yeah, that, that's exactly my interpretation of what Reich is doing. He's working backwards. So, mm-hmm. uh, and I said this in the article, he's, he's got this, uh, this socialist utopian dream. He's, he's starting with that, and then he's sort of working backward to, uh, to assert, propose all these big wealth redistribution schemes and all the other big government stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost, I get some of the eeriness of when I used to read Krugman sometimes, and, and when he would be critic in his mind, you know, he was ostensibly criticizing his opponents, and he would basically just be confessing to me, like, this is what I'm doing. And that's why I'm seeing it in other mode. You know what I mean? Like, it was just so eerie on some of them. He'd be going on for sentences at a time about, this is what the, my opponents do on this issue, when it was, like, so clearly, like, him describing himself and him <laughs> not realizing it. And I was like, ugh. Like, it was creepy. <laughs> it was giving me the willies at some point. So, yeah, likewise here, like, like with, with, with Piketty, for example, the work of Thomas Piketty when it comes to income inequality. Uh, you know, Phil Magnus has done a good job on this. Um, yeah, I have a co- I co-authored an article with him, but he just keeps going through. When it comes to you know Magnus or uh, Piketty and his co-authors trying to show how much income or wealth inequality has gone up over time, it's like there's four different key decisions that need to be made with how to treat certain data and whatever, and they just so happen on each one of those key decisions to pick the you know to come down on the way that maximizes the income inequality or the wealth inequality. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that seems like kind of a coincidence that you're always on these issues that are kind of up for debate. Like it's a, it's a judgment call always coming down on the thing that you know, maximizes that headline. So you can, uh, you know, then run around and show, oh, inequality is the worst it's been in, you know, this many decades. Yeah. So I wonder if we should uh, move on and talk about the the second video. We probably should. So yeah. let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. So the, the second one is, uh, uh, he titled it, the, or the second myth that he deals with, he says it's government obstructs the free market. Uh, he, he He's making the claim that the, the free market can only exist if there's a government there. Um, and therefore, like, they're, like the free market itself is a myth mm-hmm. because there's no such well, thing as... Maybe we'll just play an excerpt, Jonathan, just to make sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good idea. For people who have not been tortured. <laughs> That's bunk. Politicians of all stripes talk as if the rules that govern the economy are determined either by the free market or by government. But that's wrong. There can't be a choice between the free market and government because a market cannot exist without a government to organize and enforce it. A market is an arena where goods and services are exchanged. How that market functions depends upon rules determined by government. The rules govern property, what can be owned, monopoly, what degree of market power is permissible, contracts, what can be exchanged and under what circumstances, bankruptcy, what happens when borrowers can't pay up, and how is all of this enforced? These rules are decided on one way or another by human beings. But who exactly and whose interests are they representing? Over the past few decades, large corporations, Wall Street, and wealthy individuals have gained increasing influence over politics. Corporate tax spending has reached hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Business lobbyists spend 68 times as much on lobbying as labor unions. Okay, so now that the viewers have seen a taste of it from Reich's own mouth, so go, go ahead. So what's the problem with that? thesis. Yeah, so what he's saying is that the the government is necessary for markets to exist uh and and then he starts talking about all of the influence that big corporations have uh and and the really rich people what sort of influence do they have over the laws that are enacted in the United States. So it, so the the myth that he's trying to debunk is that is that there is a free market and also that 
we can think about a market that's se- that's separate from government. So I, I guess in his mind, it's it's just sort of this inevitability that big business is gonna is gonna acquire all of this power, not only you know corporate power, power like within within the economy, but he would also say like political power. Uh, and so my issue with with his analysis is that it's really surface level. Uh, I, I do think he's right. Uh, so it's very true that big businesses uh, have the ear of politicians, and big businesses spend you know millions and millions of dollars on lobbying, mm-hmm. uh, trying to trying to get you know nice government favors, trying to get contracts, trying to get you know subsidies for their own industry and taxes on their on on competitors, tariffs so that uh, they can diminish competition from from overseas. And so his his analysis is basically yeah this this happens this is why we need you know strong uh, what does he say uh, centers of of countervailing power yes yes centers of countervailing power uh, the idea is that we in order to combat this all the power that the, the super wealthy have we need we need ways for the lower class and for the middle class to, to be able to fight against them. And so in his, in his mind, that's what a labor union is. And that's what, um, I guess, regulatory agencies that are looking out for the common man. And we all, we all know that, you know, government regulations are looking out for, for all of us, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but that's, but that's his analysis. So like the solution to this problem is just, we, we need, we need, uh, the lower class and the middle class to have this ability to to fight the big business and the power that they have, and I I simply point out that there, there's a way to solve this uh, that that strikes at the root, and the I I argue that the root is state power. So if you don't want big business to to have this ability to infect the laws of the country in such a way that gives them this benefit and exacerbates income and wealth inequality. Then what you need to do is just get rid of the ability for the government to intervene in, in markets in that way. So, like if uh, if it's bad for businesses to uh, distort markets by by getting these favors, by getting taxes on their competition and subsidies for themselves, then get rid of the government's ability to offer that. So m- maybe we should just have the, the government not have that power in the first place. Um, <clears throat> and then I make the claim at the end, it's a really short article. They're short videos, and like I said, there's not a lot of substance. But at the end of my little short response to this, I said uh, that Reich, Reich's, or Reich, I always mix up how to pronounce it, uh, his his solution uh, is it's just perpetuating the, the hungry, hungry hippos fight. Where So he correctly identifies that it's a problem for these big businesses to have all this power through the government, uh, and then his solution is, well, we just need you know bigger levers for uh, the lower and middle class to mash on, so they can also grab what they can get from through the use of government power. Uh, and so I I brought in a quote, a great quote from Bastiat. You already brought him up in this episode, uh, where uh, Bastiat said that government is the great fiction through which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else. So my solution is just get rid of get rid of that ability. Get get rid of the ability for businesses and also for uh, for work, workers unions, for example, to get these special favors from the government and just let the free market be the free market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what you're saying, Dove. Well, actually, before I forget, let me my my joke. Yeah, with the with the pronunciation of his name. So yes, folks, I I believe it's Reich, even though it looks like. And so that's why I was thinking when the next one drops, Jonathan, we can come <laughs> back and then say what's wrong with the Third Reich, the, uh, <laughs> or the third <laughs> the Third Reich myth. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I think what you're saying, it dovetails with my problem with Noam Chomsky. You know, I saw some clip somewhere and I'm sure he's written it up and whatever, besides him just saying it in an interview where he's talking about, you know, the, the anti-state right wingers who are with him on certain issues. And he's, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, yeah, they're, and, and their primary focus, you know, they're worried about limiting the power of the state, and it does, you know, it engages in wars abroad, and at home it can engage in oppression. And he said, "I'm totally with them. They they spy on people." And but and he said, "But what they overlook in their you know narrow minded focus on limiting the state is countervailing power." And so that if if you just got rid of the state and you know put it in a box, then that would let these giant corporations run rampant and you know violate workers' rights and you know not pay people their pension and rip off consumers with poisonous overpriced products and blah, 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 blah. And, and so, yeah, so in his mind, it's, it's a balancing act and we got to empower the state enough to keep the corporations in check 
but then also, you know, and among other issues with that is to say, yeah, the, the more powerful we make the state, who's going to end up controlling it? You know, Joe Sixpack or, you know, some, some, uh, you know, uh, activist from the inner city or something, or, you know, some guy from a Baptist church down, or these giant corporations that can funnel millions of dollars into the campaigns of the people who, you know, come through. So anyway, that to me, that just seemed kind of naive, even on his own terms that, you know, the solution to these giant powerful corporations is to create something even more powerful than them and just hope we keep control of that thing. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed about, um, this, this segment of, it's like the Bernie Sanders type, the Robert Reich type, the Elizabeth Warren type, the very the progressive Democrats, um, is that I, I, I think they're, well, I don't know if I, I can say this about all of them. I think their heart is in the right place. Uh, for some of them, I think, um, you mean in like terms of like in their body where it is? <laughs> I think they've correctly diagnosed a problem. I, I mm-hmm. really do think that there is exacerbated income and wealth inequality in the United States. I do think that that is influenced by the the power that Reich has identified here, that bi- big businesses have with government. Uh, but I I also noticed that there's this really big blind spot, uh, and like they never really address the the Cantillon effects. They never address what I think is the primary driver of 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 exacerbated income and wealth inequality. Of course, I think that, you know, a free market, the unhampered market economy is going to have some income and wealth inequality. People are different, have different skills. Capital goods have varying productivity. Different pieces of land are unequal in their in what they can produce, which means that we're going to have unequal outcomes all of the time. But I definitely think that the inequality of, of income and wealth that you can measure in, in various ways is exacerbated by money printing and and none of them ever address this they never address all of the government spending all all of the uh all of the work of the fed they they never even talk about what banks do with credit expansion so and it seems to me like especially with like what banks are doing it seems like that would line up really well with the rest of their narrative and the rest of, the, of their worldview uh, because you know that's that's a big center of of power mm-hmm. right the financial system in the united states but they seem to have this sort of blind spot. I don't know if it's if it's an intentional blind spot, like they they sort of realize what's going on there, but for other reasons they're trying to ignore it. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, like if if you're a leftist and you re- you really are concerned about income inequality, really your first stop, the first place that you should look it, at is the Federal Reserve. It's where is all of this new money coming from mm-hmm. that that pushes up the, the incomes of the people who are closest to the money spigot. Yeah. Um, so you I may you may not have intended for the discussion to go down that way, but no, that just sort I, of came I like to it, me. and I'm glad that it's it, it's nuanced, and that's why people come here, right? That you, that you and I like. The, 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 I appreciate you trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, with some of those people, like with <laughs> Bernie Sanders, like the thing that I just can't take him seriously is how I believe it's been documented. At least I've seen a meme to this effect. I didn't go double check. Is that you know he used to be rallying against millionaires. And then once he himself became a millionaire, <laughs> then he changed it to against the multimillionaires and billionaires. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, because of his book sales or whatever. Um, so there, there's that Elizabeth element. Elizabeth Warren is worth, I, I, it's like 11 or $12 million. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Robert, I, I, Robert yeah. Reich has millions of dollars. I can't take Elizabeth Warren seriously for various reasons. But uh, in general, that <laughs> issue of like, are these people sincere or not? I think there probably are some. And also, I imagine the average Bernie Sanders supporter I'm sure I could find a lot of common ground with whether or not with, you know, Bernie Sanders himself or his inner, inner, um, team. Um, but like for the environmentalist stuff, like for example, if you really thought, I know we're kind of going off on a tangent here, but just to respond to what you're saying there, John, if you really thought that humanity needs to drastically reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the next 10 years, or we're all dead, then you'd be a huge proponent of nuclear power. But most of them are not. Now, there actually are a couple that did come around. So I actually think those guys are, I think it was James Hansen is, is the one I have in mind. I'm pretty sure, you know, he was a big guy testifying, you know, back in the, in the 80s about we got to do this. And then he came around to, yeah, I tried for 20 years, couldn't get anybody to care. And so at this point, yeah, we got to go full nuclear because that's the only way. So at least I think, I think he's wrong, but at least I, you know, believe that he believes what he's saying. Whereas a lot of these other people, I just don't believe them. I think this is a smokescreen 
that what they really want is a bunch of power. They don't like capitalism and so on. So likewise here that, yeah, a lot of the demagogues that, especially if they go to Washington and they make a career out of this, I, I actually don't think they want to know, is this really helping poor people or so? In other words, let me give you this example, like raising the minimum wage, even though now there's debates about, you know, Oh, how big of an effect does it have? And it's, you know, maybe it's not as obvious in terms of the literature as it would have been, 30 years ago among economists. Still, there's lots of them saying, oh, the, the earned income tax credit is a much better way to subsidize you know, low-skill workers and to help them out that doesn't have a lot of these unintended consequences or baggage of just raising the minimum wage. And so, but yet that's not that's not a thing. Like the, the you know, so I just um a lot of these quote labor leaders and whatnot, I I think that they're helping unions. I don't I don't think they care about, you know, the average teenager working at, at Burger King. Um, what about though? So we're just getting back to the video here as we're, I'm looking at the clock. How do you feel Jonathan about the, the central claim that there is no such thing as, uh, cause again, to, to try to steel man, the argument that him saying there's no such thing as the free market. Like you guys have this notion you're holding up that, ah, we can imagine it, you know, whether it's good or bad, but you know, let's take Mises at face value well, the way I just, you know, depicted him a, a 10 minutes ago. And say yes. What? Let's study the operation of the pristine, pure, laissez-faire market economy, and how would that work? And then let's contrast that to a system where there's government intervention that changes the outcome, and see which we prefer. And I think Reich is saying that first thing: it doesn't that doesn't exist. It doesn't even make sense that you couldn't to have a market economy. You're presupposing the existence of property titles and, and law enforcement and blah blah blah. So what are you talking about? There's no such thing as the free market absent government activity. So how, how would you respond to somebody who comes at you like that? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm not as uh, as familiar with all of this literature, but I know there, there's uh, been a lot written about uh, dif- different societies throughout history that didn't have like the central government. They had mm-hmm. other other ways of organizing themselves that were more voluntary, um, and they and they had markets. So there, I, there, I know that there are some historical examples of this, uh, but another way to think about it is uh, in a lot of our like just daily interactions with other people and also in our market interactions with other people, like is is the reason why I am able to uh, go go to the grocery store and purchase a bag of apples, for example, like is the, is the only reason that I'm going uh, through with the tr- that transaction in that way is, is because that there's this there's this threat that if I didn't, uh, pay the price for the apples and, and instead just tried to steal them from the store. Like is 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 the only reason why I went through the transaction the way I did because of this like threat of government force. Like if I didn't do it that way, if I tried to steal it, then I would be put in a cage. I like to think that uh, even if there wasn't this this threat of of me being put in jail for stealing, that I would I would still go through with the exchanges the way that I am. Um, of course. Um, there are there are there are bad people out there. So I'm not saying that if we had this you know pure market economy, no government, that there would be no crime. But I, what I am saying is that for for most people, probably they would they would still go through with their lives in the, in the same way. And so another um, another thing to say on this point is that it's what uh, anarcho capitalists like Murray Rothbard. Uh, are arguing for is they're not saying let's just you know get rid of all law and all law enforcement. Uh, I, they argue for a a system in which those sorts of services are offered on the free market itself. Um, and and you've written about this as well in your book uh, Chaos Theory, uh, where it it's, po- it's at least conceivable where we can uh, have insurance companies, we can have private security, we can ha- have all of these sorts of things that are uh, enforcing private property, upholding the norms that we. Uh, right now, have outsourced to the government that would allow for like the proper functioning of a of a market economy. I know that's that's sort of like a wandering answer to your question. It sort of took three different directions there, mm-hmm. but there you well, go. I, I mean, I think you you did hit the the essence of it. That yes, if if one is an anarcho capitalist, we can take that head on and say you're right, Mister Reich, that it it it's uh, it is horrible government intervention, and that's why. You know, you as a leftist should appreciate. Look, look at all the poor, innocent, you know, minorities that were falsely convicted and or locked up for, you know, relatively trivial things. You know, the, the U.S. has a huge prison population. So yes, government intervention in law enforcement 
is horrible, and they shouldn't do it there either, just like government intervention in the pharmaceutical sector is a bad or in money and banking, that the last people in the world you should trust with enforcing the laws are corrupt politicians and, you know, they're bureaucratic minions and whatnot. So you, you, you kind of, whereas like Mises would be a bit hamstrung and he'd have to say, well, the proper role of government, in my view, is, you know, running the legal system and the police and whatnot. And that and there's a pretty sharp line between that and trying to raise uh, workers' wages or something for social reasons. So I do think, yes, Rothbard can answer Reich on this point more directly and without, you know, hemming and hawing than a, a classical liberal in the old tradition uh, would be able to do. But another thing, too, maybe here as we wrap up, just I think you alluded to this earlier, Jonathan, is that we're we're kind of here steel manning Reich even in the second video because really when he started out with this thing about oh it's you know you didn't build that it's you know, everybody takes a village and there's no you know no man's an island but then it just turned into corporations are the ones lobbying and so on that score I think we would say right and that's why it's not a free market so I think <laughs> I think that's part of it is that and I get again trying to be trying to be uh, sympathetic and and. Uh, merciful and understanding here more than he deserves a lot of right wingers who tout the free market we won't name names or whatever but and and actually what they mean is like yes modern u.s capitalism that's what i mean by the free market it's awesome and 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 whereas no like actually us associated with the mises institute i would say are more consistent and just because a big corporation does something doesn't mean we say yep that's the market and we love it yay capitalism that yep. if a corporation's doing something cuz it's gotten special privileges from the state well then no we're not we're not good with that so we're not pro business i guess that's maybe the distinction to make yeah do you have good anything point. else you want to say on that score as no, we wrap I up i think you got it okay so maybe the last thing that what what is the rothbard graduate seminar oh uh rothbard graduate seminar is going on right now we've got uh um uh, quite a few uh, graduate students and I think a couple uh, um, undergraduate students who are here. We're taking a deep dive into um, Austrian economics, in particular the work of Ludwig von Mises in Human Action. So Human Action is like the most important book in in the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, it was even important for Murray Rothbard when he was writing Man, Economy, and State, another big treatise. Um, and so this is this is a deeper, higher level discussions, higher level lectures than what you would find in Mises University, another great mm -hmm. program that we offer that's targeted more to undergraduate students. Um, and it's wonderful. We get a few lectures each day, some discussion, um, and it's it's a wonderful time. You should, if you if you're a graduate student, especially, I highly encourage you uh, check it out. Look at the events page at uh, Mises.org. Yep, great, and yeah, I would echo that. You know, I was at a few of the RGSs, you know, back in the day. And and yes, everything Jonathan just said, especially if you've been to Mises U and you like that, this is now, you know, the next level up, that it's more intense, a smaller group, and you focus more on, on you know, the, the, these court texts. So it's, it's good stuff. Okay, well, that's a good place for us to wrap up. Jonathan, as always, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Bob. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And maybe as Reich releases further episodes, we'll come back and hit the Third Reich. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org. <laughs>